All right, it is time to get started. That is our bell. We're going to go ahead at this time. If you have any prayer requests you'd like to share with us, uh, we have our prayer sheet here up with a lot of names. But we would always welcome any additional prayer requests that you might have tonight. I want to thank everybody for the prayers for my supervisor's son, Christopher. He has made some improvement. He's out of ICU. He should be able to go home in a couple. Of years. What's Christopher's last name? Nichols. Now, uh, Cliff, what I found out, it took a little bit of time for me to get this out of him. He's a police officer. And his partner was shot. I don't know his last name, but I think it's. His name was Jake, Jake, no, not Jake, but Jacob. Did I say Jacob? Yeah. Oh, I, I'm not sure of his name, but he's in a coma. They were serving a warrant. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, but anyway, I wish I knew his name. But I'm in there. But he was shot 12 times. Yeah, Christopher was. Yeah. I don't know how many times. I know he's doing it. Wow. We... I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine what tore up on the inside with being shot. Yeah. Everyone over here. Yes. I have a very regret on me. Me, Chad McGill, and uh, also my wife, Catherine Mary. She is not doing real well. What it came tonight. Guys, can we please can we please stop our conversations and listen to the prayer request? That would be much appreciated. Chad McGill and Catherine Barry. Catherine. My wife and she's not doing too well. She has like a like a, a breathing. She does breathing treatments all the time. And I wish she'd get off that thing because, man, it just, it, it tires her out all day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just, I just hope she gets off of it because, I mean, I hope she can catch her breath every day. It's just this, this heat. And I couldn't be outside today, but uh, last Sunday, I'm sorry I wasn't here, but I had to do a, a roof for a lady. And so... I did that. <laughs> We're glad you're here tonight, Chad. Catherine Ferry. Okay. Catherine Ferry, right? Yes. All right. Thank you, brother. All right. Anybody else? Joe. Joe is, is on here. Yeah. Uh, see, where is he at? Let's see. And no, I, Jennifer and I saw him earlier today. Talked yeah. about him. Okay. Well, maybe we talked about him from the email. Give me the name again. Make sure it's Joe, Joe Madden, right there. You you marked right oh. by it. <laughs> it's a snake. It bites you, wouldn't it? Ow! <laughs> but Joe is doing better, from what I, I gather, right? Yeah, he's having heart surgery in the morning. Memorial Harmon the Medical Center. Hmm. I would like to ask for a prayer for my niece, Victoria. Uh, she is having surgery today, or she, she was in surgery, and so I'm asking for prayers for her. Uh, I've been praying for that family that she came. And, um, and then thank you for the prayers for my brother. He had to go back to the hospital, but he said he's, he's recovering. So. What's Victoria's last name, Ms. Anne? G-U-I-L-L-E-N. This Alabama boy had to learn those pretty quick after moving to Texas. I was ignorant. And Gustavo and I are traveling to visit family in the valley for the weekend, so we'll be back hopefully that willing on Monday. But now. Alan, update on Miss Bobby. Um... Woo, I haven't talked to her today. Well, you've and, been working. I'm, I know that. As of last night, they had headed out. 
So would you like to give everybody that's in here an update on her, what's going on with her, so that everybody kind of knows? She's sure. moving back up to Searcy, Arkansas, where Harding University is. And, uh, Bobby Barker. Bobby Barker. We'll be surrounded by relatives, okay. and we'll be staying with family until a room opens up. At, I think it's called Harding Place. Yeah. An assisted living center. And uh, her house was on the market for 48 hours. They got a bidding war and it already sold it before. Wow. Uh, <laughs> that tells you something about the housing market nowadays, yeah. right? Wow. So financially, hopefully she'll be doing all right. Well, I'm glad that she's able to, to get up there. You know, it's something she's wanted for a while. Well, I'll tell you what, you can, uh, you can say Oh, wow. Phil, Ellen Murphy, Carrie uh, Myers, and Micah, and uh, Doss, Debbie, and Marcus Doss. Doll they pitched in to, to help get her to move. sweat, jumped to it, and yeah, pitched in. Heard y'all were there until about five yesterday? Yeah. Thank y'all for that. And a few more hours today. And again, thank, uh, blessings on Bobby because she's donating what she did not take to Zen and Shane. Yeah, I heard about that today. That's wonderful. So it's like, you know, a multi pronged blessing. Those of you who don't know, uh, Zen Carlos, you familiar with the name Zen Carlos? Zen uh, had her baby over the weekend. In fact, I believe had it on Sunday. Is that right? I heard emergency C section. Well, we were not sure exactly what happened, but just Jennifer and I heard that she had had the baby. So. Yeah, so at least we can confirm that there was a big birth. So we've been uh, trying to help them secure a place to live. Can you imagine? Well, there's a story in the Bible kind of like that, isn't there? <laughs> having a, a baby on the way and not having a, a place to stay. A place to you know lay your head down at night. I believe they've worked out something. I believe they found something. Any other prayer requests? Clint, do you still have uh, Kurt Doss on there? Clint Doss? Clint? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Clint? Clint, uh, Kurt. Anyway, Kurt, Clint, they're both the same. Okay. Is it the same, same person or different people? They, no, they're, they're both the same. Who they so, go with? What, what name do they go by? Kurt. Kurt. Right, we'll change that from Clint to Kurt then. <laughs> give him, give him four to six weeks. Four to six weeks. Wow. Uh, uh, do, you, do you mind sharing what form of cancer it is? He has uh, kidney cancer and lung cancer both. Sorry, brother. This prayer list does not get any shorter. Y'all realize that? <coughs> and, you know, we, I don't think we realize sometimes just um, how important this is to people. I've had visitors to our congregation. I've had, we've had people that have placed membership here because they appreciated the fact that we spent time to do this. And, um, I was going to tell you, I appreciate the prayers for Tom Davis, too. He is doing better. Yeah, he's yeah. off the ventilator now, right? Yeah. He's supposed to go into rehab. These are not just a bunch of names. These are real people with real struggles. I was going to ask anybody, you know, we know about Gene Cuba, right? Everybody aware of Gene's situation? Who has he been sharing with us, Diane? It's his daughter. daughter. Okay, so he was in Temple for a funeral. Does anybody know whose funeral he was there? His sister-in-law. Sister-in-law, but it's not Diane. No. Okay. Thank you for that. Miss Mary. Take my name off the list if it's still on there. I think Jennifer and I took it off today. We we. Mm -hmm. <laughs> after talking to you yesterday, you said you said you were a spring chicken again. <laughs> 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 We're glad to see you able to be back with us. Anybody else? I've been watching the chat. I, I, oh, the other one I see is, is Bobby. Of course, I uh, brought up Bobby a few minutes ago. I can't remember Nora's last name. I, 
I had y'all put it on that email. Nora Jean Peck? No, no, no. Uh, Nora is uh, Coraline, right? Coraline? Something like that. Uh, so today I got a call from Jay Hunt. If you know Betty Hunt's in tough, she's really struggling. So they're taking her home, um, and they're looking for somebody to help out with her. So I suggested to Jay, uh, you know, about Nora, maybe. He's going through the grapevine right now. Becky Hastings contacted me. Okay, and good. Message to Phil. All right. Because Nora's <clears throat> my main prayer is that she find permanent refuge. Permanent would be better, yes. Yeah. Because she, you know, it's not just Bobby Barker that she helped. There were members of this congregation over the years. Wow. That Nora had worked for. Us. That's how she came to Bobby Barker. Bobby Thompson. Bobby is uh, doing better. She goes back to the pulmonologist tomorrow, and if she gets a clean uh, bill of health tomorrow, she'll be back with us on Sunday, Lord willing. Which is amazing when you think about it, because she not only had COVID, but she was dealing with bronchitis and a lung infection on top of that. And she she knocked that thing out. Well, we got good news last Monday. Edwina was cleared and accepted at Methodist for water therapy. So she will begin water therapy. The doctor and the therapist said that the strength in her legs is there. It's just that the mind doesn't know what to do. So they're going to work her through a, a series of treatment to try to get the mind and the feet and the legs to start talking to each other again. So. We're praying for, 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 for that. Wayne, how are you doing, brother? Hello. Okay. <laughs> You're down here, so I just want to go good. Our, our, our producer extraordinaire over there. Yep. He always does a good job for us. All right. Any, any others? Good to see you tonight, Jack. How are you doing? Better. Better. You uh, you eat more now, Jack? Are you able to sleep any, Jack? A little bit better. A little bit better. Good. That's the key to society, though. Be able to sleep a little bit better? Or you've got to keep killing somebody. <laughs> as long as somebody and not me, we're doing good shape. <laughs> Jack, Jack, do you have do you have a my pillow? <laughs> I have a my pillow. It actually is pretty good. Two might be better than one. <laughs> well, I got a king size my pillow. <laughs> All right, everybody knows what to get Jack for his birthday. <laughs> He has an anniversary coming up next week. No, oh. Sunday, yeah. Sunday or Monday? Yeah. 60 years. More Anita. Wow. Miss oh, <laughs> <Anita. laughs> Jennifer got older on Sunday. Yeah. She, she got, I think, like 65, somewhere around there. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. Sunday she was 65. Yeah. Sunday was 65. Yeah. Sunday was 65. Yeah. Sunday was 65. Yeah. Oh, she's here. <laughs> I don't want her to throw anything and me be up here. It's okay. <laughs> you and my pillow might be out with the dog. Tonight too. Hey, hey, I sleep with the dog anyway, so. Oh. No, it's, the dog is not at all. <laughs> We'll move on. Oh, this is, oh, this is going down. downhill quick. Let's I go think we God better pray. Yeah, I think we better. That. Father, we thank you so much for love and for laughter and for the opportunity that we have to come together and to enjoy each other, to be able to have this time of fellowship that where we can, can help each other, we can encourage each other, we can build each other up, Father. We can... We can relax, for we are all together as one. Father, I thank you so much for this body of believers here at Waters Road. And I pray, Father, your special blessing upon mm -hmm. each and every one. Father, thank you so much for the generosity of this congregation and how that we are able to help spread your word throughout the entire world. And I pray, Father, that you continue to bless those that 
day-to-day, Father, that takes your word out to a lost and dying world. Thank you also, Father, for the safety of those that travel down to Casa, Father, and to come back home. And I'm, I know, Father, that they were blessed, and I pray, Father, that they were a blessing as well. Father, I pray this evening that you would be with Jonathan and I. Thank you so much for him and for his ability to, to be able to study and to teach. And Father, I pray that tonight as we teach this very deep lesson, Father, if we teach anything wrong, I pray that you would defeat us. Father, thank you so much for this wonderful book and all the lessons that it is even applicable to us today, Father. I pray also, Father, that you would bless those that are less fortunate than others. We know that there are those that are dealing with long-term illness, and there are those that are in the hospital, those that are, are awaiting test results, those, Father, that are at the end of their life. And, Father, whatever each of their needs are, Father, I pray that you would bless them and be with them and let them feel your presence. But we pray this evening for Peyton Alanese and for Karina Ayers and Arnold and Sylvia Avant, Bobby Barker, Father, and Ricky Barrett and family, and Adria Bennett and Mary Bernard, Vince Bernhardt and Mary Blackwell. Father, we pray for Sam Brain and Loretta Brennan and Aubrey and Carl Brew and Norma Brown and Cindy Burt, Jenna Canales and Linda Cantrell and Norma Carter and Gary Clark and Ben and Laura Clay and family. Robert and Tammy Clay and Sonny Cole and Lydia Cortez and Steve Corica, Clint and Studi and Judy Cross and Diane Cuba, Father. We pray for Gene Cuba and I pray that he'll be able to return to us soon. Dale Davis and Don and Cheryl Davis and Father continue to, to be with Thomas Davis, Father. Elizabeth Dinwiddie, Kurt Dawes and Helen Dawes and Judy Doty and Janelle Dutton and Avery Gonzalez, Michael Graham and Sherry Green, Jose Gillian and David Harper and Al and Rebecca Hastings and Audrey Hawthorne, Sharon Hayes and Jessica Hazel. I will pray for Leslie Hoffman and Emily and Brandon and White Hood and Leslie. Uh, we, we pray, Father, also for Don Hobus and Jim Hummel, Betty Hunt and Jerry and Pam Jones and Wendell and Connie and Johnny Kylers and Jack Knight, Father. We thank you that he's able to be with us this evening. Teresa Lynn and Rick Ludwig and Joe Madden. We pray for Chad McGill and and also his wife, Kathy Perry, Father. Colton Marshall and Larry Nice and Christopher Nichols. Shirley Norris and Sue Ogden and, and Linda Ohm and Jen Olivia and Fred Olson. Father, we pray for Norma Jean Peck and Ron Pope. Riley Porter and Billy Preston, Mike Rushing and Manuel Salinas and family, and we pray that you would bless and be with Anna Salinas, Becky Sanchez and Mary Sewell, Millie Smith, Sam Swope, continue to be with Wayne Taylor and Bobby Thompson, and my wife, Edwina Thompson, Pat Wagoner and Charlie and Dale Waller and Pam Warren, Clyde and Shirley Watson and Dudson Watson and, and, and also his family father, Justin Wilson and Bob York, Mike and Tammy York, and Victoria Gillen, Father. Father, I also pray that you would be with those of our own household, those that have never named your son as their Lord and Savior and put him on in baptism, or maybe at one time they did, but now they're walking in the darkness. Father, it's our prayer that their heart would be pricked and that they would either turn to you or return to you before it's too late, Father. Also, there are still those that are dealing with the coronavirus, and I pray that your blessing will be upon them, that you would continue to be with those that are, are on the front line, that are doing the research as well as taking care of those individuals. I pray for your protection, and I also pray for wisdom that we may be able to find a cure and be able to put this behind us once and for all. Now, Father, I pray collectively for all of us that you would forgive us of the sins that we've committed in our lives and that you would bless us, Father, with your love to where we can forgive those who have sinned against us. 
is our prayer, Father, that you would have mercy upon us and lead us not into temptation. For we're weak, Father. We are, are human and we will fall. And I pray, Father, that in the end, whenever you call each of us home, Father, I pray for a peaceful passing for us all. And we ask all this, Father, in the name of Jesus the Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. You know, Cliff and I have been talking uh, over the last couple of days. You know, anytime we teach something that is this difficult, I mean, how many of you would, would agree that Romans chapter 9 is a fairly difficult chapter in the Bible? Yeah. The, the last thing that we want to do is, is lose you. Like, leave you somewhere back in Romans 9, verse 1, and we're all the way down in verse 17 or 18. Um, it's kind of one of those balanced things where we want to make sure we cover this the way it ought to be covered, but we also want to make it as applicable and, and practical for you as possible. So we just ask you to bear with us. I mean, we've still got some pretty tough stuff to cover here. So we just ask for your patience as we try to do the best we can in covering this in a way that will help everybody. I think about somebody who may happen upon this stream. Uh, this is live right now, but it'll be archived. And I think about somebody that might happen to come across this and wanting to understand this particular chapter. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and open our Bibles to Romans chapter 9, verse 14. We're going to read Romans 9, 14 through 18 out of the English Standard Version. Paul writes, What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Now, we've talked about a few folks. Talked about Abraham and his wife, whom? Sarah. Talked about Isaac and Ishmael. We talked about Jacob and Esau. And just like we talked about on Sunday morning with Moses pointing to Jesus Christ, ultimately these individuals point to a nation. And what is that nation? Israel. Israel. So the question is, is there injustice on God's part to select one of his people to be his chosen nation and not another? Is God unfair to elect Jacob to be the one through whom the covenant blessings would come and not Esau? I want you to go back and notice Paul's answer. Verse 15, he says, uh, he quotes Exodus thirty-three nineteen. 19. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. We're going to talk about that particular verse in Exodus a little bit later on. But when I read that, and I think you read that, we go, well, that doesn't seem to answer the question. You ever ask somebody a question and they just give you a statement that doesn't answer your question and you're like, wait a second, I want you to answer the question. They, we call that good what? Politics. Good politics. Good politician. Paul's not a politic here. He's not a politician. He's not politicking. He's passing, uh, pressing the problem to a deeper level. How can God have mercy on who he desires to have mercy. Isn't this an injustice on God's part? That's the, the big question here, Cliff. Good gracious, Jonathan. That's four questions that he just got to ask. Me. And every single one of them is as deep as they can be and meaningful unto themselves. Uh, we'll get around to try to answering these questions, but 
whenever you look at it, folks, there's five times in our study of Romans that Paul is going to ask the same question. What shall we say then? He starts it out in Romans 3, 5, in 4, 1, 6, 1, 7, 7, and in 8, 31. He asks the question, what shall we say then? Paul here is anticipating an objection. A human reaction, you could say, to God's choice of Jacob over Esau, and he anticipates men is going to be judging God and accusing God of being unjust. And yet, folks, we know, without a shadow of a doubt, from studying God's attributes, that he can never be unjust. I mean, being unjust is just not in God's essence. So here, we can see that human logic comes to a logical, albeit wrong, conclusion. Who's this potential objection coming from? That's a good question, right? Well, I, I truly believe it's coming from somebody of a Jewish background. And remember how we talked about last Wednesday night? If you were a Jew, you thought you could merit God's favor by doing what? Being born a Jew. And that's the flesh side. And then the other side was the keeping of the law. If you had those two things and you did enough law keeping, then somehow you could merit God's favor. And and this potential objector is going, wait, I don't see that in here yet. I don't see you saying that yet, Paul. When are you going to get to that part? They had forgotten that mankind isn't divided up into two groups, the worthy and the unworthy, the guilty and the innocent. Um, mankind, we're all in one group. Do you know what that group is? Guilty. We're all guilty. Guilty. People without Jesus Christ only earn one thing. That's condemnation. That's death. But before we go on, let's look at that word injustice for just a moment. Now, before we go to the God side of injustice, what do, what what's injustice today? Anything that they say is wrong. Okay. That's a pretty broad answer, Jack. It's when the rules are applied unevenly. It's an injustice. The law says you shouldn't speed, some can, some can't. The ones that can without being punished, that's injustice. Yeah, how many times you're at how many times you got pulled over, Mike, and you're sitting there and he's writing you a ticket and you see like five people <laughs> Go right on by you, and they're 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 five and seven miles over the speed limit, just like you were. Right? That's injustice because you were going slow enough for him to catch you. <laughs> 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 well, that word injustice is interesting because of how, when you studied in the Greek, how that word is actually put together. It comes from the Greek word adikia, which you hear that a in there, right? The letter a means it usually negates what follows. So it'd be like dikia, or uh, what we actually know was the word right. Okay. So that word actually describes the condition of not being right. It's not just. Unjust means not just, right? So not being right <laughs> describes unrighteousness. Unrighteousness of your heart, are you following me? And unrighteous in your life will always be the result of your own wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. Does that mean Paul is saying that it's not a matter of injustice? No, it, it, as a matter of fact, it's a matter of God's mercy. God sovereignly has mercy on all he will. Although all deserves his what? His wrath. Every single one of us deserves his wrath. Now, Jonathan, the translator of Phillips, and you've heard Jonathan and I several times quoted from the Phillips translation, uh, he kind of takes it even up a notch. And this is kind of interesting the way that he says this, but listen to, to this. He states, do we conclude 
that God is monstrously unfair, monstrously unfair. And then he says, never, never. Do, do we get this? Do, do you follow what, what he's saying here? It, it's to me, again, and we just said it a moment ago, all of us are deserving of what? All of us are deserving of judgment, right? So if all of us are deserving of judgment, then how many of us are deserving of mercy? None. None. So it's not a matter of him giving mercy to one group or another. It's the fact that he chose to even give it to anyone. The fact that God was merciful enough to extend it to anyone <laughs> proves that he's not unfair. I think sometimes we forget who God All those in the middle of that one deserving judgment cannot be the ones to determine what proper judgment Yeah, I mean, how can you who are right here claim that God who is outside of this circle is unfair when you are the one who is the guilty party. It just, it's hard for us, I think logically, I think it's hard for us, it was hard for them. That's why Paul spending all this time doing this. But let's focus on a phrase that he uses here. May it never be. That's one of the strongest phrases in all the New Testament. Did you know that? And it's a very important phrase to the Apostle Paul, right? Mm -hmm. In fact, he uses it 14 different times. And in every case, the idea is to do what? What's he, when he makes that strong case, may it never be. What is, what's he trying to say? I like that. That's like a best that. answer. That's a great answer. He wants the thought to perish. If there's any readers reading this who have the contrary thought, let that thought perish right now. And I believe it's plain, if you really break this down to see, Paul wants to set the question close concerning, is God unjust? And he takes this phrase, may it never be, and he stamps his seal of approval. He says, you can take this to the bank. We can use it. There's a lot of Southern phrases I grew up with. <laughs> that Some of them are good to use and some of them are not. But it's to prove the point that this is an absolute, right? It's a guarantee. God is not unjust, right? Absolutely not. You know, folks, Paul does something interesting in verse 15. If you want to go to verse 15 and look at it with me. He starts out by stating, for he said to Moses. Now, who is the he in that statement? God. 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 He states this to emphasize his stance concerning God being not unjust by resting his complete argument on answering what he believes to be a double assumption. People are making assumptions, and you'll notice that Paul's trying to get ahead of those assumptions, and he's trying to answer those assumptions. Paul confirms that the first assumption by validating the fact that God is truly represented in all the scriptures. Can you believe that with me? That God is represented in all the scripture, scripture from Genesis all the way to the max. Okay. Now the second assumption Paul confirms is that everywhere in, in scripture, God is represented by three characteristics, just, holy, and perfect. Now, this is an age-old truth, folks. Though not everyone recognizes this truth. Believe it or not, sometimes discussion even emerges that seem kind of profound the difference of it. To some, God in the Old Testament is completely, I mean, vastly different than God is in the New Testament. Have you ever known somebody who made a statement like that or thought that way? I mean, from a surface level, if you're just studying the Old Testament from a surface level right. and you don't understand the process, then 
you're probably going to make that decision, right? You're probably going to come to that conclusion. That's right. But doesn't the Bible also say that God, see what that statement is? God is the same what? Yesterday and today, and and how far in advance? Forever. And you know, some would even argue that God is much more punitive in the Old Testament. And just like Jonathan just said, on the on the surface, he was quick to punish sins, kind of more of a fire and brimstone type God. I don't know. I remember as a kid uh, in Bible class, learning about the steading of the ark. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. And you, as a kid, hearing how many people died because oh, Uzzah touched the ark. So that's the ark, right? And and on the surface, my mind all of a sudden began to deduce that boy, this guy of the Old Testament boy, he's mm -hmm. he's tough. Brother Jonathan, it took over a hundred years to build that ark. So God gave him enough time. From the mouth the babes. Love it. That's the wrong heart. I'm sorry, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> we'll work there. But, but I'm saying is that even though God punished, and, and it sounds like he did it quickly, there was always some, you know, some time, you know, he gave him opportunity. Yeah, I was talking about the Ark of the Covenant, but as a kid, I'd have probably gotten that confused too. <laughs> The Ark of the Covenant is one of my favorite subjects. I absolutely love to, to study that book. And the reason why the Uzzah got killed, does anybody know why that God killed Uzzah? Disobeyed. Well, why? Because the Ark oh, had four holes. Sure. The Ark had four <laughs> rings, and they're supposed to have been carried by a gold-covered Asher pole. That's right. Where were the Asher poles? By priests, too. And yeah, but by Levi, where were the Asher poles? No, not that. Nobody knows. It was riding. It was riding on a cart. Uh, wasn't supposed to be carried that way. How did it get on the cart? Well, that somebody got it there. Did I didn't. Did <laughs> <laughs> I didn't put it there. He, he, was, he was took, took the cart. Were you saying you were there? He took the off on that day. He took the day off. I took the day off there. But you know, some. But you glad? Yeah, boy. But you know. <laughs> Maybe the New Testament God, whenever you look at him in the New Testament, maybe people, they may think, well, wait a minute now, folks. Even in dealing out the punishment of sin, maybe he's doing it to a lesser degree. He's more patient. He's more forgiving. Maybe he's more kind over in the New Testament. But, folks. Oh, Ananias and Spire didn't think so. No, no, Ananias and Spire didn't think so at all. Folks, to, the truth is, that the God in the Old Testament is the exact same God that's in the New Testament. They're all, he's all one in the same. And we know this because Scripture says as, as much. And Paul will use that argument now about God being the same in the Old Testament as he is in the New Testament right here to prove this point. And to prove the point, he uses the context the context is king, right? We say that all yeah. the time. Yes. But let's go to Exodus 33, 19. That's the quote that we talked about, okay? Go there in your Bible. Because I think in order to understand Romans chapter 9, you've got to jump in that time machine you've got right there in front of you and go all the way back to Exodus. And especially, we're going to look at Exodus 32 in a moment, but... Exodus 33, 19. We'll get there in a second. Yeah. We're going to start out in 32 in a second. So we need to understand the original context in which God said these words, okay? But before we look at the actual code, let's look at what led up to God saying those words. Exodus 32. Flip back to Exodus 32. Just quick, Quickly scan your Bible. Tell me, what's a big incident right there in Exodus 32? Golden calf. Golden calf. Can anybody in this room tell me what was the purpose of the golden calf? Well, Aaron gathered up all that gold and he just threw it in the fire. Out came the golden calf. Walked out of that. <laughs> <laughs> I always loved that. Because the right. Israelites were impatient. That's right. Moses fire. stayed up on that mountain far too long. And the people incited Aaron to build that calf because they needed what? They needed something, something to, tangible to something tangible to worship. Very Amen. good. So you got Moses up there doing his thing, right? He comes down this mountain. 
He sees the golden calf. The Bible tells us his anger burned to the point that he did something that just amazing. What did he do? That's right. What verse was it? What verse was that? 32. I don't know the exact verse. I've got it just written down here. But just look in 32. It's right there. I promise. As Cliff says, you know what Prego is? It's in there. It's in there. Well, remember what came next? He stood at the entrance to the camp. And he said to the he said to the, 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 the camp, Who all is with the Lord? Come to me now. And who come to him then? The Levi. The Levi's. The Levi's did. And I mean they ran to him. And the Lord said, Put you on a, a sword. Start at one end of the camp and go out the other end of the, the, the camp. And I want you to kill your neighbors. Kill your brothers and kill your friends. That day there were 3,000 people that lost their life to the sword because of the, what the Levites did. And that was the day that the Levites were set apart? That was the day that the Levites were set apart. Can you see why? I've often wondered what that night was like. The very next day, Moses said to the people, he said, I'm going to go petition to the Lord to see if he can make atonement for these sins. We know that Moses pleads with God, but God stated whoever sinned against him, God was going to do what? Blot him out of his book. Mm. And he commanded Moses to go and lead the people to the place he spoke of. And when the time came for the Lord to punish, the Lord is going to strike those people down with a plague because of what they had done. You know, at that time, Moses used to take a tent and he used to pitch that tent out on the other side of the camp. Anybody remember what that tent was called? The tent of meeting. The tent of meeting. And anyone who wanted to inquire of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting. And when Moses would go out to the tent, all the people would come to the door of their own tent and stand there until Moses went to the tent of meeting. You remember what happened whenever he would go inside of the tent of meeting? What would come down on the tent? The pillar of cloud would come down, showing the presence of the Lord being there. And when that happened, those that were standing outside of their own tent, they would begin to worship the Lord as Moses went into the tent. And the Bible says that God would speak to Moses face to face. And listen, folks, just as a friend speaks to another friend. It, it, it's amazing when you, when you look at the story here of Moses and his relationship with God, Moses had God's ear. No, he never seen his face. No, he never seen no, his face. face. We're going to get to that in just a second, because that's the key right there, Jack. But he had God's ear, so much so that, you know, in this situation, the Lord wasn't going to go with him out from Mount Horeb. Mm -mm. <laughs> because, you know, the Lord, he was so angry at this point, he wasn't going to go with him, but... I think the word that the scripture uses is the Lord relented. And told Moses, said, my presence will we'll go with you. And that he would give Moses rest. And God was pleased with Moses. And by going with him, it showed that Moses was distinguished from all the others. And that the people of Israel were also mm -hmm. distinguished from all the other people on the face of the earth. So then we get to what is a strange request, right? He said, I want you to show me your what? Glory. And the Lord says that no human face can see the full face and glory of the Lord and still what? Live. Ever God said he would make his goodness 
pass before Moses. And then he said these words. What were those words? We've read them already tonight. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. Okay. You know, folks, God had never granted such a privilege to anyone ever before. So with Moses, God showed grace and he showed his mercy upon him and allowed his goodness to pass in front of him. Now, likewise, God, rather than consuming the whole nation of Israel because of their sin with the golden calf, he spared a <laughs> sinful nation. God's mercy came in spite of our human will and our human exertion of to rebel against him as we still do to this day. And the point is God is free and does not have to show mercy as Jonathan showed up there to anyone. No one deserves the Lord's mercy. No one deserves God's mercy. Is God unjust? Not at all. Because everyone deserves God's wrath. Folks, we're crazy to ask God for justice. Can you imagine asking God for justice? It's no. Not as bad as asking God for patience. Oh, go. Oh, hmm. hmm. He might give it to you too, you know. <laughs> Folks, we're losing our mind when we want to demand God is being unjust. God's acting out of mercy enough not to snuff out our own lives, folks. Think about it. Look at this next text. This is the context of Paul's point to the Christians in Rome. The whole point, folks. God is acting in mercy to choose his people, the true Israel, which is not unjust. The stunning thing for Paul was not that God rejected Ishmael and Esau. That wasn't the point. But that God chose Isaac and Jacob. For they didn't deserve to be included in God's merciful and gracious purpose. But they were. Folks, human effort leaves us in condemnation. We cannot clear ourselves of sin and God shows mercy because God chooses to do so not because of us Jonathan any of you ever played mercy <laughs> you know what I mean mercy. Yeah. It's, it's, it's one of those intimidating games you can never play with another man in fact they often call it the Greco, uh, was it Greco Roman knuckle lock? Because you can take somebody, if you're strong enough, and you can bring them to their knees to the point where they have no ability to fight back to you whatsoever. You've gotten their, their wrists are bent back to the point where they have no way of defending themselves any longer. I've always wondered why we call that mercy, but there's an answer as to why we call it mercy, because the only way you can get out of that move was to say what? Mercy. mercy. For a long time, I really uh, correlated the idea of mercy as that situation. We are down on our knees and we're begging out for mercy. Mercy, God, mercy. But what is mercy? When it comes to God, what is mercy? Well, mercy with God is the fact that we've done absolutely nothing for God to bestow that mercy upon us. <laughs> Even long before we ever cried out for mercy, God had mercy on us. None of us were ever deserving of said mercy, right? Another part of mercy is that it also implies that the one who's giving the mercy is, is what? Then the one who needs the mercy. Do you know the answer to that? 
more powerful, superior. superior. He has all the means to meet the need of the one who needs the mercy. When you when you study in Jesus' parables and you see that hint of mercy in Jesus' parables, can you name a parable that Jesus taught that speaks about mercy? Can you think of one? One where the uh, the uh, debtor is for there you go debt, and then he goes out and so you had the first person was in so much debt there was no logical or or feasible way he could ever repay that debt so he had no power to fulfill the debt the only way he could be freed is if his master did what forgave it right that's the idea here there's a need and god meets that need can you contrast mercy and grace that is boy that's a deep one because I think it, it it does go hand in hand. It does. That's one of the things I cannot keep from praying for every morning is thanking God for His mercy and also for His grace and to think about each one of them individually. Yeah. And His immense love for us and how they all tie together. Mercy stems from grace. That's the way I pray for it, the grace of His mercy. Well, the way I was taught, the way I was taught, just like the old marriage song, love and marriage go together like a horse and carriage. Just to tell you, brother, you can't have one without the other. Yes, I watched Married with Children when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> Worst thing you could ever watch. I, like it you I don't know what it was back in the early in the late eighties. Um, you'd go home from church on a Sunday night, and that was on TV. I still don't get it. I look back at it now, and I can't believe we watched it. But sorry, I got off the point. The point is. How could you have grace from God without having his mercy? And how could you have his mercy without his grace? To me, they're inseparable. There are differences in them. But they're inseparable in the sense of without God giving one, the other is not even possible. So the difference I heard was that mercy is God not giving you the punishment that you've rightfully deserved. And grace is him giving you the blessings yes. that you have not earned. That's that is the most common. That's the most common explanation. I, I like it. I think I mean, it's it true. Yeah. And you're right. You can't. The grace doesn't mean anything if you don't get the mercy first. Right. So. And I will say this. We talked about Ishmael. Did God have grace on Ishmael? Sure did. He he provided for him. He didn't give him the ultimate blessing though, did he? And I think America is enjoying the grace of God right now, not necessarily his mercy. Mercy is withholding the judgment we have coming. And that's grace is the time. Christ, you can only find that in Christ Jesus. You can get the graces without the mercy, but yeah. you can't get the mercy without being in Christ Jesus. I enjoy blessings for things I've never done, but I'm not getting forgiveness for that. That's between me and God and his forgiveness, right? Great question, though. It is. Do y'all think that Paul is kind of dealing with a pride problem here through all of this, though, ultimately? Because who is sinful and imperfect man to try to judge whether God is holy and just? Who is man that he would even question God? Well, and if you think about it, issue. if you think about it, Mike, that's the very essence of which Jesus dealt with in all of his years of ministry. Right. Those very same people that are that are the potential objectors here are the same ones that in Jesus' day we're putting him to chat to task with dealing with that type of mentality. I love the laborers out in the working the eleventh hour. A guy comes up to work and he pays him the same wages. Same thing. You're mad at me because I'm generous. I gave you what I told you I'd give you. But this guy, and you're saying yeah, but today it wouldn't work in our society. The EEOC and the Fair Labor. They <laughs> said you can't do that. But what God was saying is, it's mine to give as I. As I see fit. And, and I'm having mercy on whom I'll have mercy. Why are you begrudging me? For well, now, Mike, take that back to what that, that we're talking about here. Because right now, Paul is dealing with who? Jews. The Jews. That's right. And, with the, and him dealing with the Jews. Legalistic Jews. The legalistic Jews. <laughs> yes. Who? They think they're special. They think they're, they're That's special. Right. That's right. And the Gentiles, they should be able to, they should have to do everything that we do. That's right. 
That's what their mindset. And that and that's what Paul's dealing with here. I mean, right? even even Peter dealt with that problem. Yes. Sure. And Peter spent a lot of time with Jesus, and yet he still. I, I was listening to a preacher last night uh, that said Peter was being racist. <laughs> And I was like, "Ooh, I ain't never said that before. I'm not going to say it that way." But, but in a sense, his his relationship with the Gentiles was quite a struggle. Who dealt with Peter? Paul. Paul. Yeah. Sure did. You know. Reprimanded him actually. Didn't you know, he? God did not have to show compassion on Moses. God did not have to show mercy to Moses. God chose to do so, and by doing so, allowed Moses to see his goodness. Now, folks, likewise, God shows compassion towards Israel by only killing 3,000 of the Israelites instead of killing off the whole nation. Have you ever thought of it like that? That was the first time they were all in danger. Well, yeah, I mean, Israelites been in danger a whole, a whole bunch of times, Jack, but he did not. He did not, because they were more wicked than godly, but purely because of his grace and mercy. There's, they were in great need of a great compassionate Lord. And God was gracious. God was gracious to them by not destroying the whole, the whole nation. And in all reality, folks, aren't we all? For without God's mercy and grace, where would we all be heading to? They didn't think so. No, they didn't think so at the time. It, it, it's there's there's an overlying issue here that I, I want to make you aware of. Before we go home tonight, I want you to think about this. If you've ever been a part of a church, a local congregation where the demographics of that church were changing. Whether it was age or different races of people, whenever you're a part of a church and its demographic begins to change, what is their temptation to do? Go somewhere else or be indignant of the fact that the church's demographic is changing, right? That's a small part. But you've got to understand what's going on here in Rome right now. You've got a church that at one point was primarily made up of Jews. Guess what's happening to the makeup of that church? Gentiles are coming in. Gentiles are coming in. And what is it likely that some of the Jews in that church are feeling as they see more and more Gentiles coming in to be part of this congregation? Getting pushed out. Yeah. Pride. Pride. And it wasn't long before they expelled all of them from Rome. Pride's an evil thing. It's very humanistic. Yeah, it is very humanistic. Yeah, right. It, but, you know, it. It, it's again, it would be very easy for Paul to have started verse one and said, you know what? God rejected you because you rejected his son. He could have easily started out chapter nine and just came right out and said that and ended the conversation. But if you'd done it that way, this, whatever Jews were left in this congregation would have done what? See, that, that, as a preacher, I understand that there are times where there are subjects that, I mean, you're tempted just to get up in the pulpit and ram down people's throat, but if you do it, what's going to happen? And it's not speaking the truth in love. Which we're That's the key. The reason why Paul is taking all this time to explain all of this is because if God extended that kind of love to their forefathers, he's going to extend that same type of love in trying to explain this very, very difficult subject to these people. And I think we have a hard time reading this and then comprehending it because, frankly, none of us in this room are what? We're not Jews. We're all what? Gentiles. Gentiles. So it's hard for us sometimes to relate to this. Ronnie, you and I had this conversation last Thursday night, right? 
it's hard for us to see where Paul's coming from. The key here is you have these Jews, and they have a problem with God extending mercy and grace to whomever he sees fit extending it to. Why? Because in their entire existence, they have been honed in on the idea that they are God's chosen people. And whenever you've been that for so long, and then you start seeing God extend mercy to these Gentiles, the pride begins to seep into the heart, right? We think this is just a, a feature of the humanistic side of us back then. But folks, it's still a problem today. It's still a problem today. Still to this day, God extends mercy to whomever he chooses to extend mercy to. And that doesn't always sit well with us, does it? Because sometimes they don't look like us. They don't talk like us. In our class on Sunday morning, we were talking about, uh, you ever you ever seen somebody that had sleeve tattoos all the way down their arms? You know what I'm talking about? Someone came in, into this building and on Sunday morning and had sleeve tattoos all the way down their arm, tattoos on their face. The reaction sometimes of people are is what? Shock. 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 Yeah. Judgment. Judgment. 20 years ago. 20 years ago, that would have been really the... But thankfully, we live in a time now where people are beginning not to have that reaction so much. The point being, if that person comes to Jesus Christ and has a relationship with Jesus Christ, God can change his life just like he can change my life and I don't have a single tattoo. But it's hard sometimes. That's what was hard for these Jews. And God was showing mercy to people that just didn't fit right to them. They had always been specifically commanded to keep themselves completely separated from these people and all their customs and everything were all set up to completely separate them from the Gentiles around them. Yep, and, and now all of a sudden... Let's get together and have a fellowship meal. <laughs> Love y'all. This is tough stuff, but I appreciate y'all bearing with us. Let's pray together and we'll, we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you so much for loving us and being gracious and merciful with us. Father, especially this class and all of us who are here together tonight, Father, I ask that you would give us safe journeys back to our homes and a continuation, a continuation this week of uh, your plan for our life and whatever it is you'll bring before us over the next few days. Father, we thank you for your church family here at Waters Road. We thank you for anyone who is our guest. And Father, we pray that we might reach out and love on them, Father, and show them our desire uh, for them and love for them and compassion, just like you have extended that to us. Forgive us, Father, when often we are short-sighted and we don't see just how much grace and love you've extended to us so that sometimes we don't extend that same grace and love to others. So Father, I would ask you to forgive us of that. Help us to, to look at others through the gracious eyes that you have given us spiritually to look through through your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen.